Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is the founder of Earthship Biotecture, Michael Reynolds. After receiving his degree in architecture in 1969, Mike started hearing news stories about the growing issues of garbage and how forests were being clear-cut to build homes. So he began to build structures out of garbage in Taos, New Mexico. Over the next 15 years, he developed the Earthship concept, which encounters all of the natural phenomenon and creates sustainable, off-grid, autonomous structures. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. And now here is Paul talking with Mike about Earthships. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today we have a very interesting topic. We're going to talk about Earthships with Michael Reynolds. I found out about Michael Reynolds' work um, years ago. A friend of mine said, you got to see what this guy's doing. He makes homes that are really beautiful out of garbage and and tires and cans and all sorts of stuff. And they're energy efficient and everything. It it seems really in line with your values. And I got sidetracked and, and never really got a chance to look into it. And I was doing some research recently and on YouTube. And then all of a sudden a video came up with earthships and I saw the picture of the home and I got, Oh, I remember that. So I started looking, I went, Oh my God, this is so important. This is so good. So I watched, uh, Michael's documentary called garbage warrior and several of his other videos on YouTube. And I was really impressed on many levels. So I reached out to Michael to have him on the podcast. So Michael, welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check and now you. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's been a, a great uh, investigation looking into your work. Maybe we could start by having you tell us, give us a definition for the listeners of what an Earthship is, because that concept could leave people imagining all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. Well, we call them Earthships because housing has a preconceived idea. And it just turns out that housing as a, as a rule now is becoming, uh, in my opinion, an archaic idea uh, the way we do it. In other words, everything about the way we live on this planet needs to be rethought. And um, so we're rethinking housing. And in the process of rethinking it, we don't want the residue of housing in the, in the concept. So we call them earthships. And to me, uh, uh, the, the quick definition is they're vessels that sail on the seas of tomorrow. That's kind of beautiful. And uh, the, the vessel, just like um, a space vessel or a sailing vessel at sea, they have to provide you with everything you need. So we, we then determine what we think people need. And there are six things that we have determined that people need for life, for sustenance. And they are water, comfortable shelter, electricity, sewage treatment, food, and dealing with your garbage. And if you don't think like dealing with your garbage is a problem, you know, uh, let the New York City uh, Waste Management Department go on strike for three days and see how much garbage is put piled up into mountains on the street and you'll realize that garbage is one of our issues for sustenance, and we have to address it. So we want these vessels to address all of those six things for people off of every grid. And uh, that's the definition of an earthship. It's a vessel that will sail on the seas of tomorrow by encountering the natural phenomena of the planet to address humanity's six basic needs for sustenance. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. It's well thought out. It's important. Speaking of the sewage treatment, years ago, I was writing one of my books and I was investigating issues of toxicity in the water and I was looking into sewage and I came across a website called Surfers Against Sewage and I started looking and they had pictures of surfers out with poop floating in the water and out in the ocean and stuff. 
And so I started doing more research and I found a research paper talking about the sewage problem in New York. And at that time, I don't know if they're still doing it, but there were tons of the New York sewage was being dumped out into the uh, ocean. And they said there was mountains of sewage literally from the bottom of the ocean floor all the way up, almost coming out of the surface. And I don't think many people are aware that, that you know, a lot of sewage still is ending up in uh, waterways. And, and of course, these sewage treatment centers are pumping uh, water back into the system, but people don't realize they cannot filter out medical drugs and all sorts of environmental chemicals, farming chemicals. So we've kind of created a, an illusory system of managing waste, but it's, it's uh, actually poisoning people to this very day. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, that's my observation too. Uh, we, we came up with a, you know, a building, uh, these things came about and evolved slowly. In other words, we didn't just immediately start addressing those six things. We started addressing garbage first, uh, you know, uh, back in the 70, early seventies and building out of garbage because garbage was in abundance and we don't want it. And trees were diminishing, and we want them. And that's the beginning reason for the thinking. And so we started building out of garbage, but then the energy crisis hit, and we started saying, okay, well, these buildings need to heat themselves and cool themselves. And so we started incorporating the physics of that. And then the water shortages start getting talked about. So we added water harvesting and energy for electricity. We added that. And then Sewage treatment, you know, everywhere we have been all over the world, whether it's New York, London, or Argentina, or Malawi, they don't know what to do with sewage. It's, it's a, they just don't deal with it properly. So what we're trying to do is, is, is make a situation where it's an easy path to follow, almost as if it were a yellow brick road, that easy, to sustenance, autonomy, sustenance and autonomy for people to simply glide, fall into easily uh, so that it, if you're making it easy for people to go this direction, then you have a chance of, of turning things around on this planet. Because right now, all of those six things are given to us by government or corporations, and they're not, they're not even given a damn about how they get it. It's all about money and selling it to us. So we want to be responsible. We want every person to understand and be responsible for their own shit. You know, <laughs> <make> my <laughs> literally. Shit oh, right. literally, yeah. My shit is going to be dealt with on my property and I'm going to go through the biology to deal with it. And that, I think that's, you know, we've come into this centralized power, centralized water, centralized sewage treatment, piping shit all over the under, under the streets of, of Prague and every every city in the world, piping shit in pipes is just absolutely ridiculous. You can make shit go away biologically and turn into soil on your own property. And just like sun shines on every house, yet in the name of green and sustainability, we're going all over the world, humans are, and filling up green fields with solar panels and calling that green and putting that power into the grid and then delivering it to the house that already has the sun shining on it. I mean, I'm just seeing the way we live on this planet is insane. I want, I really want no part of it. Well, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing is, though, that the problem is something that you've devoted your life to creating solutions for. And that, I think, must have given you a sense of meaning in your life and a sense of purpose. Well, it, 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 it has gotten to be, um, you know, it's getting, it's getting, uh, more than a purpose. It's getting to be a driven, I'm, I'm driven at this point to at least illustrate that there is another way. Uh, and you know, it's, it's gone beyond money, beyond relationships, beyond anything. Um, uh, I can't let it go beyond health because if I die, I can't do it. So. Uh, I, but it, it is, but see, at the same time, it's fun. It's a hobby and I do use it as an income to, for what I need. So it is just, I live, eat, breathe, and think it all the time. And, and I'm making some headway. You know, we have a building now 
that we have just finished. It already it sold before it was done. That um, you know, it's 20 below here in the winter. I'd go out there first thing in the morning to work on it. It'd be 71 degrees inside. No That's fuel, beautiful. no heating, no anything. And it would have right now, uh, Mississippi is uh, even wealthy people are waiting in line for some bottled water. I'm sitting on 7,000 gallons of rainwater, just waiting to be used. Uh, electricity, the same way. Uh, the house has got a greenhouse all the way across the front, so I'm harvesting tomatoes. I mean, as they were, two, I call it um, COVID winter two years ago, when uh, you know everybody was, first of all, quarantined with COVID, and the power went out in the, back in uh, uh, Oklahoma and uh, Texas and all of that because of the lines getting ice on them or a storm or whatever. And people were waiting in line for food, waiting in line for water. Mothers were taking their kids out to the car to turn the car on to keep their kids warm. Some of them did it in garages and killed themselves. And I'm walking down my hallway barefoot, 20 below outside, harvesting bananas and tomatoes. And I'm thinking, this you know, I want this for everybody. All these people that are going through the trauma and the stress of trying to get some water, no matter how wealthy they are, trying to get some food, no matter how wealthy they are, uh, water running down the steps of their three-story, $3 million house because the power went off and their pipes froze. I want a better way of life for everybody. And I, I want it because the world will be a better place for me if this stress and trauma is gone. And, you know, I think, I think that's the root of a lot of the problems we have is they're, they're the things that we have for with the way we live on this planet aren't working. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, watching your, your videos and seeing, you know, you pretty much have very much what looks like a permaculture model where they're, you know, what they call food for us. You, you really set your homes up very, very beautifully. And, I remember in one of your videos, you were, you were pointing out all the bees that were around you and, and how beautiful that was. And it made me reflect on a comment by Rudolf Steiner, who a long time ago said, human life as we know it depends on two things, bees and trees. And if they reach a critically low level, life will cease to exist as we know it. And we're, and we're right there right now. I mean, we've, with the bee populations are dying all over the world and they're cutting the rainforest down at an incredibly rapid rate and logging, clear cut logging all over the place. It's almost as though we have a lot of smart, stupid people in the corporations that don't seem to realize they're they're basically greasing the guillotine for everybody. Well, you know what I what comes to my mind? I'm I was raised uh, Baptist, so I I uh, you know I know religion. I don't really buy all of that right now, but um, Christ on the cross. The last he had seven last statements. One of them was, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do." Yes, indeed. I, I look at every super intelligent person I see these days in corporate and political levels, and that's what I have to say. They don't. They don't know. They do not know what they're doing. They think they're people think they're doing good here and there, but they just don't know that. They don't know what they're doing. And I think I think the education of, you know, or, or the exploration or the demonstration of uh, another way to live on this planet is kind of a must. And um, I, I think if it addresses the six things that people need and it's made available to them, that there there is a chance. I mean, we use our buildings that we build in this community we use them as Airbnb nightly rentals uh, until they sell, but they've been selling too quick to actually get that to happen these days. But um, they, the things that people write in the guest book are, they're unbelievable. They, they inspire me because of what people say. They, people do not know that this is possible. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And you, you, you actually hit on exactly what I wanted to talk about next. It, it, you know, I, I just cracked up laughing when I was watching your Garbage Warrior video and you mentioned that your parents were Baptist, no drinking, no dancing, and you said you had to get the hell out of there. <laughs> I, I was just laughing for all sorts of reasons. But 
I've, you know, I'm a therapist and I've been doing this for almost 40 years, helping people with every kind of problem you can imagine. And uh, when I track what is causing people's illnesses and diseases back to the etiology, it almost always comes to some kind of a religious belief system. And I have come to the realization in my 61 years of life that belief systems are very, very dangerous. So you know, a lot of what we're talking about boils down to belief systems. So I'd love it if you share, could share your thoughts on belief systems. And if you have one, how could you encapsulate your own? Well, I have, it was good that I was exposed to religion and democracy <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. all, all these other things. But I've been through it enough. I spent four years in the legislature as the movie shows, uh, trying to uh, get a law passed, which I did. But um, too little, too late. But um, I'll tell you the truth. I, I think uh, the the thing that we are dealing with that that we are dealing with with our work is we're actually looking for the truth. And when you say you're looking for the truth, you got it's got to be unarguable. It can't be democracy or socialism or baptism or or Catholicism or Hinduism or whatever. All those can be argued with. Think of something. Think of something that you cannot argue with. Gravity. And, and exactly, that's one of them. Sun, wind, breath. Rain. You don't. You don't argue with. I mean, you want to argue with gravity? Go jump off of a building and see who wins the argument. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, you want to argue with the sun? The sun is. The sun is honest. The sun will tell you. You go out in the Sahara Desert for five days naked without any food or water, and I'll kill you. Yeah. Or you build a south-facing uh, glass uh, ha house with south-facing glass in the mountains of New Mexico, and I'll make you cozy and warm. The sun just tells you the truth about what it will do. No politician will tell you that. And you can't argue with the sun. The sun shines on Jews. The sun shines on Russians. The sun shines on Germans. The sun shines on lizards. The sun shines on black people. The sun shines on gays. The sun shines on everything regardless. You cannot, and there's, you're a fool to argue with the sun. Now there is something I want to look at. I want to listen to. I want to encounter the sun. I don't want to harness it. Uh, you can't. I, I don't want to harness things. I want to encounter them. And if I encounter the sun, if I learn enough about the sun to encounter it, I can stay warm. I can grow food. I can get electricity. So I'm simply encountering the unarguable natural phenomena of this planet. I think that's important. I've said many times in my podcasts and in my teachings, I own an Institute of Holistic Health, uh, which I founded in 1995 and teach the principles of holistic health. And I've told people many times on podcasts, especially since uh, COVID started, I say, look, all this issues about whether you should vax or not vax or what race or color or religion you are or what sex you are are complete and utter uh, sidestep of the things that are real important. We all depend on clean water, healthy soil, food, and air. And that's the game board. I call it the dream board. None of us can live our lives without those things. And we're destroying all those things while we're getting sidetracked with all these silly corporate shows and, and false flag operations and everything else. And so I, as I looked at your material, I'm like, okay, here's a guy that's really got it. He understands what's important because without these things in place, we're, we're on a gangplank and we're very close to the end of the damn thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I mean, that's, and, and, you know, I don't do, do the doomsday thing and all of that, but uh, it is, you know, you're looking out and you're seeing clouds on the horizon and you know, that means a storm. So put up an umbrella. I mean, you know, that's that's where you're at and uh, and that's where we're at. And so I'm just every day trying to make my life uh, more autonomous. And it's pretty autonomous right now. And finding out that all of those things I can provide for myself without corporate, without politics. And I'm finding the freedom and the empowerment that that gives me. And again, I want that for everybody because the state of mind of people, the, the, 
the empowerment that you get from being able to take care of yourself. So many people, the reason they're going nuts these days is because they don't know what else to do. You know, they can't afford anything. Everything's too expensive. Getting a home is off the list for probably most of the people, for sure. Uh, Getting a home is a, a luxury for a very few people. And so it is so hard to have a life these days. I want to make a life available for people so that then the people around me are happy and secure and it makes it safer for me. It makes it makes the world nicer for me. Yeah, well, you know, I before we always, I say. There's a saying I teach all of my students. The pain is seldom where the actual problem is. For example, I've seen many cases of rotator cuff problems that wouldn't heal even after surgery. But what most doctors and therapists overlook is that the right shoulder is under influence from the liver and the left shoulder the stomach. Once we apply the principles of detoxification, support digestion, and clear parasites, presto, shoulders start healing and working beautifully again. If you learn to see people holistically, like I teach my students in Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Level 1, you begin to see the true source of our illnesses and injuries. HLC 1 teaches you many essential approaches to health and well-being, such as how to assess what key body systems are under too much stress and how to restore balance, the importance of identifying a realistic dream goal or objective that inspires each individual to stick to their healing program and make the short and long-term changes that are necessary, my universally applicable 1234 formula for assessing and correcting challenges, how to breathe optimally to enhance energy levels and mental clarity, how to use gentle movements to work in and enhance life force energy and support optimal immune function, how the function and health of the soil that food is grown in influences all systems of the body, including our mental-emotional stability, and much more. HLC-1 is just a small part of what we teach our Czech Academy students, our education system for elite trainers and health professionals. Gavin Jennings and I designed the academy to take you from wherever you are right now, even if you have no fitness or health education, to being one of the best holistic health and performance professionals on this planet. And as a Czech Academy student, you'll be able to help a lot of people reach their health goals in ways you never imagined. There is, in my opinion, nothing more rewarding and meaningful in life than helping other people look, feel, and live better. We are now accepting applications into the Czech Academy, so whether you're wanting to change your career or add a truly effective new dimension to your current skill set, now is the time to apply. Go to chekinstitute.com forward slash L number 4D Academy. That's chekinstitute.com forward slash L4D Academy. Let's make the world a better place together. You know, interestingly, you want the world safer for you, but it turns out that the things that make the world safer for you make it safer for all of us. So it it can look like a selfish motive, but I think really what you're doing is you're directing people's awareness to what's ultimately creates safety and security for not only us, but for all the beings in nature, because the very things you're concerned about are also destroying nature. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, a thing that gr- drove it home to me was, um, you know, this has been a few decades ago, um, a couple of decades ago that when I was, you know, I had books and everything out and people have been coming here for a long time. And I had all in one year, one season, I had maybe six or eight different groups coming to me, wanting me to build them a sustainable, uh, you know, colony or, or uh, uh, community or whatever. And I- I'm telling you, Amazingly enough, several of them had the same, they had it in different ways, but they said, we want an underground chamber too. And I'm saying, okay, what do you want that for? They said, for guns and ammo. And I'm like, here you are wanting me to build you a sustainable, autonomous community, village, and you want an underground chamber for weapons and ammo? Why? And they said, well, we're going to have it together. We're going to have our tomatoes and our bananas and everything and our energy and everything. And when the shit hits the fan, people are going to come try to take it from us. So we want guns and ammo to fight them off. And so I, that hit me. And I went, after I thought about it for a while, uh, I, I had came up with what I thought about it. And it's that you, the next group that came and sure enough, there was one. And I said to them, uh, they said they wanted an underground chamber or a 
or a, a safe chamber or something for guns and ammo. And I said, even if you've got the stomach to kill men, women, and children who are coming to you for your tomatoes and, and your security that you have established, you don't have enough guns and ammo. You couldn't get enough guns and ammo to kill them all because they will come and never stop coming. Your best defense, here is your best defense, and I project this to the United States and the world. Your best defense is to make sure that everybody within 500 miles of you knows how to do what you're doing, knows how to grow tomatoes, knows how to stay warm without fossil fuel. Make sure that all the people around you know how to do what you're doing. And for, na for that matter, they'll be growing tomatoes and they may be better and bigger than your tomatoes. That's great because then they don't want your tomatoes. You want to make sure everybody around you is safe and secure. Now imagine if a country did that, if the United States said, we need to make sure that every other country has got everything that we've got, then they're, well, what kind of world would it be? I mean, everybody's got everything and everybody's concerned that everybody has everything. Uh, no more people shooting people in grocery stores or driving airplanes into the Twin Towers. I mean, we're talking about a very simple, it works. I mean, it, it works on a small scale. I see it working when I make sure that everybody on my crew, on my staff has got what they need. It's just more comfortable. It's, uh, you know, I see, I, I'm not daddy, father Christmas or anything. I may, I, you know, I don't just uh, dole out whatever I make. I give people opportunities. I show them directions that have worked for me. Um, that's what we're doing. We're trying to make a yellow brick road to sustainable autonomous living. And you can't get it unless you walk down the road. We're not going to carry you down to sustainable autonomous living and put you in it. Uh, but we, the, 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 there needs to be a way to sustain, sustainable autonomous living. And it doesn't exist now. And that's what we're trying to do, just make it exist. And it causes us to absolutely turn the, shut the door on existing dogma. Yeah. You know, I think it's one of the challenging situations we face is, is I remember several years ago, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 years ago now, a bunch of scientists from around the world, over a hundred of them wrote a document to the United States government talking about these very issues and said, for approximately 6 billion waters, we could clean the waterways, we could rehabilitate the topsoils, and we could even clean the air. And they tried to get leaders of all the major countries to sign an agreement to fund this project to start putting this technology to work. And uh, not surprisingly, at that time, George Bush Jr. said the United States could not afford to invest in that. And I looked at that. I just felt sickened to my stomach. And, and you got, you know, Bill Gates worth $165 billion and many of these other people that have the money to easily implement the kind of strategies that you're talking about on a very large scale, but they, it, it's the point I'm driving at is it seems to me that greed has really become a limitation because the people that do have the money to support putting you in a position to spread this education and your technology around the world and others like it are just not getting the support. What's your thoughts on that regard? Well, the first thing that came to my mind, which you've heard from the movie, I'm going to crawl up their asshole and change them from the bloodstream. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, I, I love this. I'm looking at it that way. I'm looking at what we're doing as a virus. Yeah, I've been down the funding route. Uh, yeah, you're exactly right. There's 10 people on the planet who have enough money to save the planet and change it completely. And they would that if they all put their funds together, even a 10% of them or something, they wouldn't even miss the funds and that would change everything. But they're not going to do it. And you're, we're not, you know, as goody two shoes as Bill Gates is or, or Oprah Winfrey or whatever. I don't see them. No, maybe they don't, haven't found the cause yet to do it. Yeah, you know, they all give a lot to charity and this and that, but it's peanuts. It's, it's not, it's less than peanuts. Um, but they, they haven't found something that is worthy of it, maybe. But the point is, we can't wait. I can't wait. So I'm, I'm like, I'm a virus. And a virus doesn't wait. 
A virus doesn't wait for Bill Gates to put a bunch of Petri dishes all around the world. A virus clicks in people sneezing and goes to somebody else's nose and mouth and eyes. And a virus spreads its own self around the world. And COVID did that. I think that this thinking could do the same thing. And it, it is. I mean, I'm seeing it compared to 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. I'm seeing the awareness of this thinking change. It's not changing fast enough. That's the problem. The world is, the earth is getting destroyed faster than this curve of awareness is, is growing. But the thing is, uh, it that's the way it will have to be done. You're not, I don't believe that we can organize politics and, and money enough to do it. Although, the, you know, you drive across the United States and you see thousands and thousands of acres of land. And I don't need good land. It, it, I've got, you know, it could be, it can be dog land. It can be whatever, because I catch water from the sky and I catch um, power from the sky and I get thermal comfort from the earth. And so, I mean, I can turn anything into an oasis. I know how to do that. And I'm doing it. Our community here is in the goddamn desert and I'm growing bananas. And so it's, it's doable. I know it's doable because I'm doing it. And it's needed. I certainly know it's needed because every every day there's a new issue on the on the tube about news about uh, uh, water shortages, power shortages, housing shortages, food, food shortages. shortages. All that is just constant. And I'm sitting here harvesting bananas, walking around barefoot. And I mean, like, I just I cannot I cannot not pursue trying to make this spread. And I, and you know, I don't, I don't, I don't franchise it. I don't, uh, I believe money is a tool, but I don't, uh, you know, like uh, the way I look at money is it's a wrench and you need a wrench to turn a boat. You can't do it with your hands. You need a wrench. Maybe you need two different size wrenches, uh, you know, adjustable or whatever. But do you need 5,000 wrenches? I mean, really? What, what the hell are you going to do with them? You're going to have to build a garage to put them in. So that's why I look at Bill Gates and the Google guy and all those people. What are you doing with that money? It's just a pain in the ass. It's a burden. Change the world with it. Find something. They're intelligent people. Find something that takes care of people and the planet all in the same move and pour yourself into it. But, you know, I don't see that thing. It's exactly that that made me want to do a podcast with you because I, you know, having watched several of your videos, I I just really felt here's a guy who's just being dead honest with people and has proven that he has the solutions and that the solutions work. And I felt obligated to get you on the podcast to share you with as many people because if people wake up and, and see the videos just to see what you've done. It will inspire a lot of people. And, and, you know, we have 14 acres and we have got uh, solar and we've got a uh, well and we've got animals and gardens and, and uh, we planted a hundred fruit and uh, nut trees. And we're, we're basically creating as sustainable a living as we can so that we can survive without depending upon the government and you know, paying exorbitant power rates and water rates and whatever. Um, you know, so my my point is just that I'm I was excited to be able to talk to you because I feel the little bit that I can do is help people find you and and look at your videos because there's a lot of intelligent people out there that understand what we're talking about. And I've seen my own students travel all over the world and start healing resorts and farms and all sorts of stuff. So I know that it's it's I think a lot of it's just exposure. People just don't realize that a guy like you is out there and, and what's possible. So my dream was to show them what's possible by giving you some airtime. Um, one of the things you said in, in the uh, Garbage Warrior is that you went to architectural school, but that you felt that what you learned there was worthless. And um, you've obviously used your architectural skills to build earth ships. I was just curious, what did, what was it about the way they teach architecture that you felt was useless relative to how you feel architecture should be done? Well, I think structure, you know, the, the physics of structure was good uh, in architectural school, 
but uh, pretty much the mass and the calculus and the structure. But after that, I don't re- I don't think anything was was usable because see what we have today. We have I'm not going to mention names, but we have architects doing flamboyant, beautiful, sculpted pieces of sculpture. And they get in magazines and they get on calendars and they're famous and they cost a fortune. They cost a fortune each month to operate, which means a lot of fossil fuel. That's a crime. That's what is taught in architecture. That's what everybody wants in architecture. And so I, that's why I said to hell with it. I'm, I'm doing something different. I'm calling it biotecture because the, the, uh, the, structure of knowing how to put things together does make some sense. But then you just need to know uh, physics and biology, uh, eighth grade physics, eighth grade biology to learn how to live on this planet. Architects are off in their own dogma. And, you know, they're I, I, uh, one of the I got uh, my license taken away in New Mexico for, you know, doing everything I do. Uh, running sewage through the living room and building out of garbage and so on. But the day that I got my license taken away, that I relinquished it, I just heard that in Durango, Colorado, an architect received an award as Green Architect of the Year or something for Harvard, for recycling cement pallets into cabinets. Right. Uh, and, and another architect right along that time had a building collapse and kill six people. And, and you know, one guy's getting a reward and another guy's killing people. And here I am losing my license for pushing the envelope to get people to treat their own sewage on site and use these valuable, valuable resources that we have. If you came here from another planet and you saw how many tires and glass bottles and cans and plastic bottles there, you, there were, You'd say this is what we should use. We don't. Why do we want to cut down trees? They give us oxygen. Let's use these things that we don't know what to do with. And actually, they are quite well put together. How long do you figure a glass bottle is going to last? A long you know, time. How long do you figure a tire is going to last compared a to time. a two by four? You know. Yeah. So I'm looking at what to, if somebody introduced two by four frame housing today, it wouldn't even pass because they'd say it rots. Bugs eat it and it burns. Forget building out of that. But we've already come up through the ages building with wood. So we can't get rid of it. You know what I tell people a lot? The way to go forward is to have a frontal lobotomy. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) And then you're fresh and new. Like I have written in one of my books, uh, uh, if I have a problem I can't solve, which I have lots of them constantly, I pretend that I just arrived here on the scene, which means I know nothing about the history. I know nothing about the dogma. I don't know anything about what's going on. All I am is I'm placed here and all of a sudden I need a home or all of a sudden I need this or all of a sudden I need that on this planet. What do I do? Well, look up in the sky. Hell, there's a there's a furnace up there that produces energy. Oh, rain falls from the sky. Oh, my God, you get into the earth. And, and you insulate it and heat goes to the cooler place. So you insulate it so it can't leave. And, you know, you look at all this physics and biology and and you just basically have an answer for everything. But those answers are not acceptable in today's dogma and world. I mean, building, I mean, when I first told an engineer in my, when I was 22, I told an engineer, I got this great idea. I want to build houses out of beer cans because beer cans are all over the streets and highways. We want trees. We don't want beer cans. I've got a way to build out of beer cans. And I started to show it to him and I was in a bar. He turned red in the face and said, you're a disgrace to the architectural community. Oh, my God. out of the bar because I was building out of garbage. Garbage is a stigma. It's a nasty, stinky thing. And I was an architect professional. And I was building out of it. And that's that kept on being the case. You know, I was a turd in the punch bowl everywhere I turned. You know what I mean? And fine. 
you know, uh, but, you know, you pour that whole punch bow on the ground and, and bury it and uh, come back a year later and you got compost that'll grow good food, you know. Well, yeah. You know, the old saying, you can always tell who the pioneers are because they always have arrows in their back. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. But, you know, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely, a, a, um, every single second is a challenge if you're doing this. Um, uh, but if you're, if I'm not doing it, I actually get a headache if I'm not doing it. If I'm not doing this, I get a headache. Uh, it's like, <laughs> I, I, I have to do this. And, but it's, I make it fun. I mean, you know, one thing I say is you can't decorate, you know, why decorate a boat if it isn't going to float? You right. Know, you, a boat, you build this boat and you put it out on the sea and it sinks. Well, well, let's find out if it's going to float first before you decorate it. So, cause I'm in, I like art. I, I paid my way through school being an artist. And That's great. so I didn't do anything except make the boats float first. And then now that they float, these boats float, these airships, they float. They are beautiful. Float. They will cross the Atlantic. So now I'm I'm decorating them. I'm having fun. I'm doing artwork as well as physics and biology. And it's just absolutely fun every second of the day. But it's also you, I'm I'm going in this direction and there's just nothing going to stop me. And I'm not getting frustrated because it's not happening overnight. Uh, the whole world. I had, I'll tell you one thing. I came home from the Copenhagen talk several years ago, the whole, you know, the rhetoric in Copenhagen where they talked about the environment and spent lots of money in jet fuel, bringing people all together and nothing happened. Um, <laughs> I got back and I was so pissed off because nothing happened there. You know, everybody was talking and impressing each other and all that. But I came back and I had the the Phoenix building going already. And I, an engineer showed up that uh, was interested, uh, you know, and, and an older guy. And of course, uh, how, how do I see an older guy? I'm older myself, but <laughs> well, he, he came through and I was, I was glad that an engineer wanted me to show the building to him. Uh, uh, and I took him through, he, he was a name engineer or something, but anyway, I took him through and he didn't say anything. I took him and showed him all the systems, all the six points and everything. And he didn't say a word. And I was thinking, this guy's not buying this. And I took him all through. And then, then I stopped. And I said, well, that's pretty much it. And he said, you know what the world needs now? You know what the world needs is one billion of these immediately. Yeah. That's what he said. That's so exactly that, right. That was that was it. Uh, um, and, it, you know, so I know. I know we've got it. You know, it's like it's like if you have. 60 people dying of thirst and you know where some water is. You know, what? Wh why aren't you going to show them where the water is? Hi, everybody. Hope you're enjoying the show. I thought I'd take a minute to sing you a little song. Dr. Quiet, she is yin. Know how she loves to bring energy in. She teaches you how to rest so your energy is always at its best. Hey! And... I want to tell you a little secret. You know how I support Dr. Quiet? I use Organifi Gold, and it does some magic to help you sleep deeper and restore better so you can get up and be a freedom fighter first thing in the morning and all through the day. And I got Drew Canoli, who created the product right here, right now, to tell us why it works so well. Drew, what's so unique about Organifi Gold except the fact that my kids won't stop asking for it? I love this song. Thank you. And I think if we were DJing this, we would do Rishi. Because <laughs> Rishi, uh. full spectrum, eight to one, yeah. beta glucans, knock you out. The queen of mushroom. Rishi is one of the most powerful things we can put in our body, especially at night. Helps restore, revitalize. Great for the liver. Yeah. So while we sleep, not only are we restoring and repairing the cells, but we're detoxing in the most effective way possible. Yes. And it doesn't have to taste bad. In fact, it could be something you crave. Yeah. And that's Organifi Gold. It tastes like Autumn had a baby with a marshmallow. Every time I have it, it just knocks me out. I've literally tracked it with my Whoop, my Aura Ring, yeah. and it adds another hour to an hour and a half of deep sleep. That's great. Ram and deep every single night. You know what's also really cool? Rishi is a wise man. Mm. It's not only the name of a mushroom. 
but a rishi is a wise man. Oh, true story. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's absolutely true. I'm not so, pulling your leg. And how much wisdom have you and I gained from night school? A Dream lot time. of wisdom. Yep. Yes. And you gain a lot when you can't sleep. You go, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> and how do I get it fixed up? <laughs> so, hey, you know, one time when I was visiting you at your house, you made me a gold, Organifi Gold as a hot tea. And I'd never realized you could make it hot. It's the best way. And I was like blown away. I'm like, wow, this is incredibly good. It tastes like dessert. Mm -hmm. But it, unlike most sweet things, if you take sweet stuff at night, you can't sleep very well and it jacks you up. But this stuff was just so relaxing and so amazing. I was like, wow, this is incredible. And I know you're allergic to coconut. Yeah. Right? So, but what I like to do, and this is when I'm being bad, you see, there's a much bigger cannoli than the cannoli you see today. Exactly. I, I would eat ice cream and all kinds of comfort food because I'm from Michigan. Uh -huh. But one thing that put my cravings in check, I take a little cocoa whip. Yeah. I put it on top of this oh, golden nice. tea. Okay. It is the best drink yeah. at night you could ever have. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm intolerant. I'm not allergic. So I did That's try it, it. It just makes me feel stressed. But I found that you know if I don't overdo it, I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to have everybody try Organifi Gold because we all need to sleep deep and pay attention to what our soul tells us while we dream so we can work together to mm. make this world a beautiful place for everybody and get our freedom back and get rid of the toxins in the government and other things we need to do. So it starts with good nutrition. Go to Organifi.com, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com and get your Organifi Gold and while you're there, use the code CHEK20 in all caps to get your 20% discount because we want you on our freedom fighting team right now. Love you guys. Enjoy Organifi Gold. I found that part of your documentary. Actually, there was a video you had on your website just talking about your dream. And so I thought that was really fascinating. And, you know, I've studied Jungian psychology for many years. I do a lot of dream analysis. So, of course, I'm looking at that dream from many perspectives, but I, I thought that was really a powerful beginning to your story. So could you share that dream just like you did in the video? I think it's very interesting because it really has some deep uh, point. There's a lot of uh, messages in that dream. <laughs> well, it was it was, in fact, a dream, but then my mind elaborated it. and I never stopped dreaming it or thinking about it. But if you're talking about the one I think you're talking about, I was in the desert. Yes. With about uh, 800 or 8,000 people, a lot of people. We're walking through the desert. Everybody's, you know, really thirsty and really hungry. And there are some leaders that are kind of leading us. And we're moving as a mass through the desert. It's just miserable. It's just miserable. And I just, I just had it. I just, uh, uh, I just took off. Uh, in a direction, a different direction, and just to explore at least, to uh, see what the hell, we're, all we're doing here is walking and dying. So I took off in a direction, and it wasn't very far. I went up over a rise and looked down, and there was a green valley with a river in it. And I went down there, and I, fuck, I got in the river, I drank, I relaxed in the grass. I mean, it was fantastic. And then I thought, wait a second, I, there's all these people, and it wasn't that far away. So I went back. I went back to them. And they thought I was crazy. They said, you're an idiot. You're hallucinating, blah, blah, blah. But I did get some people to go with me. And I took them back to the river. And they, 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 wouldn't, they didn't want to leave. And so we're all sitting there in the water and drinking and eating and everything. And, and so I wanted them to go back with me to get some more people. And nobody would go. They didn't want to go back. They wouldn't stay there. And so I went back. And I got some more. And pretty soon I did that two or three times. And then some of the people, the leaders in the uh, group, uh, started trying to stop me from, from going anywhere else, going to the river. And when I was taking people, they were trying to stop me. And that was, that was weird. And uh, that, so it was partly the people themselves believed that I was an idiot and, and hallucinating. And then the people that were leading those people didn't want me to go. I don't know why, but I kept going and, and doing it. And uh, this thing went on and then I kept on thinking about it and dreaming about it and so on. And finally, one time I went back to the crowd and got some people and was going back to take them back to the river. And, and all the people that I had brought there 
were now on two different sides of the river and they were having a fight over the water and over, <laughs> over boring. You know, so so here I get, brought them to this beautiful place and they're fighting over it. And then the, 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 the people that are out there dying don't want to come to it. And it, it just showed me human nature and the whole the whole thing is just um, uh, it, it is so vulnerable to any kind of a, uh, a crisis that you 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 have to like simply it, it just shows that you you can't bring people to to um, paradise to the water <laughs> you can't bring people to the water you can't bring people to paradise until they've had the frontal lobotomy <laughs> <laughs> well you know i think I don't know if you know, but there's what's called the third wave of psychedelics happening right now. So I think the magic mushrooms may be the lobotomy that lets the uh, unconscious speak a little bit more truth to people. Yeah, you can't bring you can't bring your baggage to paradise. You just can't do it. Uh, You have to go, you know, uh, but yes, it'll save you for the moment. But like I say, every all these people were there and had everything they needed. They forgot about when they were starving and and dying of thirst in the desert. And then they were fighting about more and more and more and more. And the point is, how many wrenches do you need? You know, what What drives greed? Does, is it insecurity or what? I mean, I'm I'm not a wealthy man. You know, I've got everything I need, everything I need and more. What I hear is what here's what makes me the wealthiest man on the planet is. You don't want tires. Nobody in the world does. But I do. Yeah. Millions of tires. You don't want shit. Nobody in the world wants shit, but I do. I turn shit into gold. And so I want the things that nobody else wants because I have learned how to alchemize them and turn them into something that takes care of me. So does money take care of me? Fuck no. You know, you can't eat money. You know, you can't make a house out of money. Money is just just a burden. I do use it as a tool here and there, but what I want, you know, if I had, if I had the billions that say Bill Gates has or whoever else is out there, this is even smart, you know, in terms of finance. Yeah. I wouldn't put it into gold. I certainly wouldn't into paper box uh, stocks, bonds, or, or hedge funds or any of that bullshit. If I had a hundred million dollars, a hundred billion dollars, millions, not much anymore. If I had a hundred billion dollars, I would put it into really good, maintenance-free, sustainable, autonomous housing because everybody wants it. Everybody wants it and can't afford it. They will rent it. They will lease it. They will buy it. You've got a cash cow there forever. I don't even want to sell most of the homes I'm building these days because they sit there and make money anyway and sell them. you got the tax problem and all that. But I'm buying, I'm building them, I'm selling them, I'm renting them. But they, are, I'm funding myself. I'm funding. But the thing is, I need, I, I'm saying, I'm not trying to make a billion dollars. I'm trying to get a billion people in sustainable autonomous housing. And I can do that. I, I, have, I even have the land to do it. I mean, I've got five 80-acre tracks that I could turn into a city right now. Uh, you know, but I can't go that fast because I don't have that kind of money. I go two or three buildings at a time, get people in them, but that's that's pathetic. That's you know, I'm I'm walking I'm walking on the desert there with 8,000 people and I take two or three over to the river. It doesn't do anything. All they're doing is going over there shitting in the river and polluting it and fighting. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when it when we look at that dream, if the 8,000 people wandering aimlessly through the desert in your dream represents humanity, what, is it, what do you feel metaphorically or in actuality that if, if those people represent humanity, what, are, what is everybody thirsting for, do you think? Well, one thing is water. <laughs> they are uh, thirsting yeah. for water, but they're thirsting for, for everything. In other words, the security of, of having water, food, comfort, and all of that, they're thirsting for that, but they're also thirsting for peace and spirit spiritual serenity and and you know all of these things i mean you can't give people just water and have them be happy they want love they want serenity they want they, they you know so what i'm saying is 
you got to start with the foundation of a building and then build a building on the foundation, sort of. Okay, the foundation of building a new humanity is autonomous sustenance. Give everybody that, and then they have time and brain cells and uh, to to think about themselves, are playing the guitar, or painting a picture, or making jewelry, are are uh, you know just decorating their lives and then that flows out into people and the beauty and those things we don't have room or time for those now in our world but if we did that affects people and i do think they're thirsty for that too they're thirsty for there are people that are lonely they're thirsting for everything everything but you have to do it in sequence in my opinion you you have to give you have to stop people from stressing over sustenance. And see, if, if, I, if I had my way, uh, what I would do is I would make sure that every man, woman, and child on this planet had sustenance, had a, had a home. It's a humble, small, little home. Every man, woman, and child over 21, let's say, or even over 18, had their space that encountered the phenomena of the planet that gave them comfort and gave them water and gave them food and gave them energy and tra- dealt with their sewage. And if, it, if, it, if everyone had that, then all of a sudden people have time to think about life itself, which is maybe why we're here, what we're doing here, how to, how to be happy, all these other things that people want. But you can't think about being happy if you're, think, if you're worried about dying from starvation or thirst or whatever. So it's there there is a layered foundation of to get to, you know, nirvana or whatever it is. And it starts with the basics of autonomy, sustainable autonomy. You can't get it through government providing you with housing. You can't get it with government providing you with money, what they just spend it on booze or whatever. You, and, and, and all the corporations, there's no corporation on the planet that is worth its salt. You know, it's, it, 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 there's no corporation that does anything except try to make money. And so that's what's wrong with the whole food industry, the whole pharma industry. You know, they, we, we give people bad food, poison food to keep them sick so that the pharmaceutical companies can treat the symptoms and they can make a ton of money. They don't want to heal them. They want to keep them sick so they can make money. It's almost too well thought out for any one person to have thought it out. We just kind of found it. But I mean, I I got diagnosed with stage four cancer three years ago. And, uh, you know, they told me to pick out a coffin. You know, they told me they're going to do all these things to me. And it was, uh, it was horrible. But I just started researching it the same way I researched physics and biology for these buildings. And I found out it's all, you know, it's, it's, there is a way, there is a way without, you know, without radiation, without chemo, it's all in the food. It's all in the knowing of your biology. And, uh, you know, and of course it get that gets you into cattle industry and hormones put into animals and it's all, everything is all connected. Absolutely. Together. Our our mess is all connected. So our solution is all connected. Yes, I think there's beauty in that. Oh, yeah, I think there's beauty in it. One of the the challenges that goes exactly hand in hand with what you're sharing is, you know, you're talking about large corporations that want to control people because it makes them profitable. And what you're really offering is a level of sovereignty, self-sufficiency, and freedom that takes... Uh, you know, a lot of the money and power and control away from the, these people that have uh, ulterior motives, as as the world is clearly evidence of. Um, I think that's probably part of the reason that you haven't got a Bill Gates using a plan like yours, because you're really creating authentic freedom, sovereignty, and and um, it just seems to me that there's too many greedy people at the top of the food chain that that don't want people to have that degree of freedom and autonomy. They'd rather 
capitalize on keeping them sick and profitable, and they don't seem to have any awareness of the fact that they're destroying the very planet that they eat from too, which has always been an amazing observation of mine. It's like, don't you realize you're killing yourself? Well, the, uh, well you know, there, there got to be a lot of analogies and metaphors and everything for trying to get people to look at it that way. Uh, one of them I did many years ago, and, and some people can relate to it, is you you look at yourself one inch from a mirror, and you're going to see little pock marks and skin pores and hair and whatever. And then you go away six inches, and you're going to see pretty much your whole face, maybe, or part of your face. You go away a foot or two, and you're going to see your whole face. You go away from the mirror 10 feet, and you're going to see part of your body. You go away from the mirror 20 feet, and you're going to see your body in the room that you are in and in your environment. And you keep on going away from this mirror further and further and further. And pretty soon, you see yourself on the planet Earth. And when you go away, when you develop the ability, let's say, to go away that far and look at yourself, there, there you see it. You, you see the problem that you are in. It's a matter of going away and looking at ourselves. I, I call it maneuvering. In other words, if you, can, if you can go far enough away from yourself to see yourself from 2,000 miles away or 20,000 miles away, as it were, or then you add to that the, you move, you circle around yourself, you see yourself from behind and above and below, then you get the picture. But if you're within an inch of your face, you're only going to be dealing with skin blemishes. You aren't going to be dealing with hunger. You aren't going to be dealing with the planet. It's a matter of getting people to get far enough away from dogma or whatever it is to see themselves and uh, and and to know that we and also it's it's to I think it's important to make people to empower people to be in charge of their in, in in charge in command of their own life, not depend on the government, not depend on corporations, uh, not depend on a spiritual leader. The sun shines on me on my face, me and the sun is unarguable. I'm, I guess I'm a pagan, <laughs> you know. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe it's we're talking paganism here. And look at the look at the corporate religion of Christianity wiped the pagans out. Started uh, destroying all the trees that they worship to to make sure that there was no way to worship anything but what they wanted you to worship, which is how they generated their money. And what your your mirror analogy is actually very beautiful, and it brings up uh, a point. Um, Having listened to many interviews with astronauts and studied the work of Edgar Mitchell, who started the Institute for Noetic Sciences, Edgar Mitchell clearly describes looking at the Earth from outer space and realizing how absolutely, utterly precious it was and how it was a living, integrated system. And, and it moved him so deeply that he came back and devoted his life to developing the Institute for Noetic Sciences to study consciousness to try to get deeper into, you know, the mysteries of it all. And I think, you know, that oftentimes people have such a myopic view of their life. And as you said, they're, they're, they're just struggling to survive. So they don't actually get free enough of the stress that, that the environment that you've created allows you to be, to go into the deeper meanings and the, the deeper philosophical or spiritual issues of life. So I think that's a lesson in itself is, is, to, is to step back and, and ask yourself what's really important and what, what, not only what's important for me, but what's important for all of us. And I think you've devoted your life to answering those questions. And I'm really grateful that you have and that you've got so many videos out there. I'm sure most of you are aware, even though you may not like the taste of organs, that organ meats are extremely important and good for you. And I've got great news for you. Paleo Valley makes an amazing grass-fed organ complex that's unique and better than anything I've ever found out there. So much better. I wanted you to hear right from Autumn Smith, its creator, exactly what you're going to get from their grass-fed organ complex. Autumn, get us informed on why we should be using your amazing 
organ complex. Okay. Well, like you said, organ meats are nature's multivitamins. And when we use them, we feel this energy and this stamina. And most people don't like the flavor. So what we did was we took grass-fed and finished organs like liver and heart and kidney, and we just put them into capsules so that you can get all the benefits, the beautiful benefits of organ meats without actually having to taste them, without liver burps, of course. And they're just freeze-dried. So again, they're not processed heavily in any way whatsoever, and they are sourced from American farmers using regenerative agricultural practices. And all you have to do to try it out is go to our website at paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, and that's lowercase C-H-E-K-15. And I sincerely hope you love it. One of the things that you said that I you know, as a guy who's got a long background as a mechanic and working in many different trades and uh, being in the military, racing cars and all sorts of stuff. And I'm an inventor with multiple patents myself. So you said something in your documentary that I thought was really important. You said, Michael believes that progress, the, the, someone said in the document, Michael believes that progress evolves by making mistakes. And I, so I, th- I think that's really important because uh, I think that if we make mistakes and learn from them, then we grow and we move closer to the truth. But if we keep making the same mistakes over and over again, well, we're, you know, it's, it's like banging your head against the wall waiting for the pain to go away. It, it doesn't work very well. Could you expand a little bit on, on that concept of, of progress evolves by making mistakes? That's, a, that's the way I've learned, is by trial and error, by making mistakes, by, by our world, our professional world, for sure, doesn't allow mistakes. You get sued. You know, a yeah. lawyer gets sued, a, a doctor gets sued, an architect gets sued. You don't get to make mistakes. That causes you to be safe within the confines of your insurance company or your professional practice documents or whatever. We have cor- corralled ourselves to not evolve. And mistakes, through mistakes, you can evolve. I mean, you know, you like, uh, like I, I just, when I want to do something and I can't figure out how to do it, I just start doing it and I'll make 20 mistakes and I'll go, wait a second, but this could work. I wouldn't have learned that if I didn't saw this not work. And so I didn't see it not work. So I'm just saying, I'm a big fan of mistakes. And anybody that knows me will tell you that, you know, I make, Tons of mistakes, but every once in a while I get something right. And I've been making mistakes for 55 years and I've got quite a few things right. And those things by right, I mean, they work. That doesn't mean they're going to still improve or evolve or whatever. But but the thing is, I, I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here on buildings that will take care of people. And, and I and I want. 8 billion of them out there for people because it will it will be the foundation of the birth of uh you know of humanity starting to bloom. No humanity's not going to bloom now it's struggling for life because I think humanity if it bloomed we would be so surprised at what we really have in our genes to do. But you know I've seen plants that way. I've seen plants when they're struggling just to stay alive they're just some green thing that just sitting there struggling, trying to stay alive, and it manages. But when you give them nutrients and nourishment and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, from the healthy nutrient water and everything, they do things you never thought they could do. They bloom. They go crazy. They expand. They You have to hack them away with a machete. I mean, um, it's, and see, I, I grow plants that way. I'm not a green thumb. I'm not a, a gardener, really. Um, but when I started running gray water through rubber lined botanical cells and recycling it into plants, the plants started going crazy. I'd never just water a plant again. I would give it something, use some food, some, some shower water, something that's got more in it than just clear water. And the plants just go crazy. And I mean, people ask me a lot of times, well, what do you do um, if you go away for three months? I say, well, the worst thing that's going to happen in an airship when you go away for three months is when you come back, you're going to need a machete to walk down your entry hallway because your plants are going to take over. And that's how happy the plants are. 
and and there's you know you can actually see I used people used to ask me can you eat enough out of an airship and I'd say well you know I'm a steak man and I eat steak with bacon and a side of bacon and a margarita and and uh, so no you can't eat you can't stay alive out of your airship it can exhilarate you your food but now that I've been a vegan for three years. Um, I don't touch animal products for all kinds of reasons now um, that I, for, you know, for all kinds of reasons, but uh, yes, I can stay alive in my airship. I, you don't need as much food as we, eat. we, we eat way too much food and knowing now that I've studied and know the foods to eat, I certainly could stay alive and healthy in an airship um, uh, with, uh, without anything else really. Uh, so that's, that's a statement right there that, that if what, what that requires is when you ask, when a person off the street asks me if you can stay alive in an airship, well, that the answer has got to be categorized here. I mean, what do you eat? Do you eat hamburgers three times a day or what do you eat? If you eat food that is homegrown and good for you, yes, you can. If you eat, you know, duck and turkey and steak and all kinds of rich dinners and chocolate mousse and all. I mean, I used to, I had a restaurant here in town that I'd walk in the door and they'd meet me with a chocolate mousse and a margarita. I mean, that's how ridiculous I ate. Now I'm, I eat no animal products and yes, I can stay alive and I'm a hell of a lot more healthy. And all of a sudden food is not a problem for me. I don't need the grocery store shelves get get empty. I don't worry. I don't care. You know, I got I got I sell T-shirts. We have a visitor center and we sell T-shirts with green trees and all kinds of stuff on them right now. You know, one of our best selling T-shirts right now. What? It says it's got a picture of me and it says, fuck you. I don't need you. (laughs) That's cute. But see, the thing is, I thought that people, all the staff thought it would be too horrible and everything like that. People are buying that because they got so many people in their lives that they want to say that to. You know what I mean? Their boss, their pharmaceutical company, their, you know, the IRS. Golf, <laughs> politics, IRS. Yeah. And, and so I can say it because I don't need it. You know, yeah, I need people. I want people and all that. But like, I don't need the grocery store. I don't need the water company that's breaking in Mississippi right now. I got 7,000 gallons of water right now waiting to be used. I, I don't need the power company and so on and so forth. I don't need the pharmaceutical company. You know what they what I'm finding out is that um, there are many things out there, little minor things, drugs like aspirin, for instance, and other little fines like that that come from real plants and stuff. The aspirin comes from the uh, from a, a willow, a white willow, and uh, but they do things. They actually some of them cure parts of cancer and and uh, uh, attack cancer and so on. But nobody pushes them because you can't patent them and make a money, make a fortune. I know. So the only things out there that are being pushed are things you can make a billion dollars on. But there are all these little I call I think they call them unlabeled or whatever drugs. But between nutrients like garlic and tomatoes and things like that and cruciferous vegetables and things like that and some of these things like aspirin and other things it's all out there to stay healthy from from uh, diabetes heart disease cancer um uh, we can move in the direction it see a, a holistic life solves all of the problems it gets all the way down to crime and insanity and poverty and you know there shouldn't be poverty because if you know how to interact or encounter the phenomena of the planet you you know like me i'm i'm i i call myself the richest man in the world cuz i have everything yeah well i think i think that the world gives us what we need uh but we have to be you know conscious enough to use it and are you familiar with the hopi prophecy uh Pretty much, not not. I, I wouldn't say I'm an authority on it or anything, but uh, yeah, I've had encounters with a lot of the Hopi stuff. Well, the the kind of the point I'm driving at is it shows 
you know, often when you see books about it, they show a picture of a rock where the Hopis carved a trail and the trail goes around the rock and then it branches and one branch goes to the right, which is the Hopi say that's the industrial world that we're living in right now, but then it just dead ends. But the other branch goes all the way around the rock for, you know, seemingly indefinitely, which would be the way that they were living in tune with nature. And so the Hopi were warning, you know, you can only go so far in the direction you're going right now before you get a dead stop. And so I was just curious as to if you if you look at where we're at and that prophecy of the trail coming to a dead stop. I mean, how, how far do you think we can go doing what we're doing before we basically create a, a, a situation that, um, well, let's just say could be. Uh, really, really a lot worse than even World War II or something like that. Well, we're, I think we're seeing it. We're seeing, like, I've been on the planet 77 years, and I'm, I have never seen this much. Uh, you know, there have been a flood here, there, there's a war, the big wars and all that. But we got it all right now. And, and virus, coronavirus too, and all the, you know, Everything's happening, and as well as the planet is getting so it can't handle it, and and we, you know, you know, think back in your life, how many before this past decade, let's say, how often did people go into grocery stores and open fire on people? That never has well, happened. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very in rare. the last ten years, it's happening everywhere. That has to do with the mental, you know, the the, the things that people are eating, the nature of life on this planet so that we we are constantly struggling you know you take a you take a little bunny rabbit soft little fluffy bunny rabbit and you you know they're harmless they're just beautiful little soft creatures but you put a bunny rabbit in a corner and come at it claws come out teeth come out it's vicious yes it's what's happening to humanity i'm seeing it and so i i'm just saying it starts with sustainable autonomous living to give people the peace that they can begin to have a life with and then all these other things start they fall into place in my opinion everything will fall into place from nutrition to health to to crime to disease to uh, uh everything will fall into place on a foundation of sustainable autonomy for everybody in other words, if what a dream it would be to give everybody on the planet sustainable autonomy in a little package, in a little vessel. You can't ever sell it. You can leave it to your heirs or whatever. But you, we're not going to play economy and, and financial games with this. You're just, you never will be homeless because you can't sell it. You can't trade it. You can't lose it gambling. This is your home and it will take care of you. It's very modest. It's very small. But you will never be homeless because this was given to you. And if you think about the money of governments spend on health and homeless and all of these things and, and rehabilitation and drug and drug rehabilitation and everything, you think about the money that's spent by a government on taking care of people's symptoms for the wrong way of living, put it all together and you could give people a two room home all over the planet. Well, absolutely. And, and, you know, the other thing, and, and this is really apparent in your videos. And of course, I know this because I was raised on a 142 acre sheep farm and I have a farm here. Um, and, but watching your videos, one of the things that, that's real apparent is, you know, you you were out there working all the time. So is your whole crew. There's a lot of you don't need a gym when you're building an earth ship. You're involved in everything. And you're also connecting back to the earth. And I think computer technology in the, in, you know, as consciousness evolved, we went through stages, but now we're in, in the mental stage where, where we live in our heads and on digital technology. And I once did a video about the difference between the analog world and the digital world. And I used the analogy of a tree and I showed its roots and I said, look, this one needs water. This one needs fertilizer this one needs sunlight this one you know needs the effects of the wind to strengthen it and give it life it produces oxygen but the one on your phone 
It doesn't need water or anything. You can actually ignore it. But if you start behaving toward the world like you behave toward that tree on your phone, then you will destroy the planet. And so I think part of the problem is, is that people have been brought up into this digital reality where they've, they've lost touch with the earth and what it means to be a human and what it means to be part of an alchemical system that needs earth, water, fire, and air to work together in a balanced way. So it, it it's, it's really, we're, we're kind of in this conundrum where we've got now such a large popula population of people that they don't even fantasize about the kind of things that you and I see as obvious. And, you know, th which might leads to my next question. Why do you think it's so hard for people to have not come up with or not accept or buy into your concept of using a lot of the waste that we have from the tires to the cans to the bottles to make things out of them that are they're actually effective and, and as you've shown very clearly, very stable and very enduring. I mean, I saw some of your, your houses in your videos were over 30 years old that you were going back and they still look like they were in great shape. Well, the, it takes, uh, you know, time is, uh, uh, time is, a, is a tricky thing, but it, it takes time. Look at how, uh, uh, how long it took for people to switch from the horse and buggy to the automobile. You know, it took, it took time. And, uh, and then to, to switch from, you know, when, when the things that we've looked back into on in history, they they do. The, the horse and buggy has now fallen by the wayside, and we do have automobiles. But now automobiles are about to fall from the wayside, you know, at least gasoline engines. And then, you know, it, but it, it, it takes time, and it, it, it takes time just because of the natural course of things, but it also takes time because of the unnatural course of things, because uh, people don't want electric automobiles because they're making money off of gas. So you got the human element in there messing with it constantly. But still, eventually, you know, eventually they run out of gas and we have to do something else. And so, you know, there's that absolute pragmatic thing that is going to happen. Reality. And one thing is I'm just trying to, uh, I'm tr I used to run rivers like I ran the Grand Canyon in a, in a little 12 foot uh, red shank raft. And what we would do, the big rapids, we would stop before the big rapid and walk down the river on the side and scout the rapid and look for the holes and things. Well, I'm kind of been doing that. I'm scouting the rapids of the future and I'm seeing some <laughs> I'm seeing some waterfalls and I'm seeing some stuff that's not navigable. So I'm trying to come up with a vessel that will make it through all of that. And that's you know, that's that's what I'm doing. I can't expect people to see what I have seen from from walking down the river and seeing what's ahead. But uh, I do see them. I, I do see people responding um, when when people stay a night in one of these buildings and write about it in the guest book. They just they thank God. They thank me. They they thank for this. They give thanks for knowing that this is possible. And I'll tell you, one of the one time somebody said something and I was livid about it, but now I see that it was the best compliment I ever had. They stayed a night in an earthship and their comment the next day was, I had I didn't even know I was in an earthship or anything special. I had everything that a regular house has. I was just, I was just, I didn't notice anything different. And that pissed me off at first. But then I went, wait a second. I've hit it. I've yes, got you the have. worship given people everything they're used to. And yes, they the same comfort level. Worship. So that was that was success. Yeah. That and and that's the beginning. That's the beginning. But uh it's you know, it's still got a long, long way to go because after that realization, you've got to have people understanding that they don't need so much. And, you know, because we do, we have we do not need to have everybody have all of the space and things that they have in terms of a home. You have to, you know, I can't just talk about it. I have to do it. I have to, I have to show it. Uh, you know, there, there are, there's a lot of people that really talk a good line of rhetoric, 
but it doesn't mean anything unless unless you're creating physically, you're manifesting. There are the there are the talkers and the, the thinkers, and there are the manifestors. On our planet, the manifestors have taken over. They don't think, they just manifest. Box Walmarts and all kinds of stuff like that. We got a lot of manifestors and we got a lot of thinkers. But we need a we need a thinker that is also a manifester. We need a lot of those. Thinkers that manifest. I think you've you've really demonstrated that. You know, there's an old saying, never judge a man by the creed he professes, but by the life he leads. And I hate the he part of it, but he or she leads because then you're, you know, the old saying, the proof's in the pudding. And I think you've really demonstrated that. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. I imagine you know that magnesium is one of the minerals that people in North America are the most efficient in, but it's an extremely important mineral to have in your diet regularly. And believe it or not, Bioptimizers has improved what was already well known to be the best magnesium formula out there called Magnesium Breakthrough. So I've got Wade Lightheart with me to explain what it is they've done to improve this already excellent formula. Wade, what is new about your new Mag Breakthrough formula? Well, it's called sucrosomial magnesium. So we have seven different types of magnesium in Magnesium Breakthrough because they're uptaken by different parts of the body. But a new type of magnesium has been created called sucrosomial. And what it shows in the research and science is that it's actually even more absorbable by the body, particularly inside of the brain, which is a big aspect uh, to enhance neurotransmitter formation, as well as ensuring the rest and relax response in the nervous system that a lot of people will take magnesium for. They find it, you know, clocks them down, helps them sleep better, allows for the relaxation of striated and smooth muscle tissue in the body, which creates an energetic relief. And so when we added sucrosomial, we were able to demonstrate inside our lab facility that we were able to get better improvements. Of course, we have a partnership with the Birch International University. We have some patents we're working on, uh, which will kind of relay some of these things. But sucrosomial was a no-brainer when we added to the formula, improved the results or improved the uptake. And the reports back from our testing team were like, wow, this we get more results with less caps. And that's always the goal for our company. That's excellent. I love it. I, I always say, and people have probably heard me say it before, I just am so amazed how you guys are constantly and always improving and working your best to not only make better products for us, but it doesn't seem to me that it gets more expensive as you make them better. So that's a real gift to the world. Thank you. Where can people get their new magnesium breakthrough formula? All they need to do is go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living4d, put in Paul 10, get 10% discount on your first bottle. And of course, if you order multiple bottles, you can get an extensive discount on that as well. And like everything else, we sell 365 day money back guarantee. If this isn't the best magnesium you've ever taken in your life, we demand that you tell us and we can give you your money back. But I think you're probably going to demand, hey, can I get more of this? <laughs> that, that's probably more the truth. So that's mag, M-A-G, breakthrough.com forward slash living number four, and then the letter D, code Paul 10. Enjoy deeper relaxation and better nutrition with Mag Breakthrough. One of the questions I wanted to ask you is, you know, even um, if everybody was to switch to solar, it's a big investment. I, I just spent my my family and I just spent uh, $90,000 to to outfit ourselves with solar for our, our property and our operation here. But there's been, been free energy technologies for a long time. I've got many books outlining free, te at free energy technologies and many men have been killed for developing free energy technologies because the government and big agencies, energy agencies, didn't want them out there. But it seems to me, I'm just curious of your thoughts. Uh, we know the government has this technology. We know there's many corporations that have the technology. What do you think would change if, if we were to able to use zero point energy and provide energy for people? Do you think that would be helpful? Or do you think that if we don't grow in our consciousness of, of the destructive powers of energy, that we probably just use the energy to make things worse? Well, I think that uh, they, that there's a shift in thinking that needs to be um, all about the individual. 
I mean, all individuals want all individuals to have what they need. And we don't want two or three individuals having all the answers and doling it out for a price to all the underlings. So I think the the concept of decentralization is it's a, that's a bad word for a lot of people. Decentralization. You know, it means no grid. I think it's it means, important. You know, it's but but the thing is we don't need it. The sun shines on every house. You know, food grows yeah. in every house, rain falls on every house. It's just so much more simple with decentralization, empowering people to have, you know, all the you know, eighth grade physics and biology. Yes, solar panels do it now. Uh, you know, then and, and when when you what you just said, ninety thousand dollars. Well, one of the things we teach in the academy here is to if you want to minimize the price of your power system, minimize the size of your home and minimize what you need. In other words, we can we can I got I got it down to I went too far. I go too far in these directions and then have to come back. I got it down to person could live and have a flush toilet and a shower in a room, staying 70 degrees, no matter what was going on outside. And the power system cost 500 bucks. I made it work, but nobody wanted it. <laughs> they wanted to run their computer and TV. And so it, I, I made it, but nobody wanted it. So I had to bring it back up and back. Home. Our power system now costs about 15 or 18 grand. It runs a two bedroom home. Um, if you want more, get more. But in other words, there, there, there is a big thing that I see uh, uh, of um, we do not want to try to to meet the needs of of the people. We want to have the people's needs be diminished to where we can meet halfway across the river. And so we're learning how to meet needs in more natural and unarguable ways and at the same time we're making our needs less and and because I have no I have no desire to meet the needs of the industrial world fuck them right you i know? understand I yeah don't, i do yeah. not have any desire to do that i have a desire to meet the needs of humans that want to stay warm and want to have water and want to have food and they have to meet me halfway across the river i can't come all the way across the river but there's lots of reasons uh, and they can't, lots of times they can't come all the way here. It's, it, I know how to do this, but I'm not going to do it for people that want to live in a, you know, a 50 room mansion and have it heated with, uh, you know, I get a lot of that. I get a lot of people that want me to really do a system for their giant situation. I, I I'm saying I don't have time for that. I want, I, I, there's too many people that aren't warm. There's too many people that don't have food. There's too many people that don't have water. For any price, I'm not going to waste Over my two billion. Gold. And yeah, and I'm not going to waste what I've got left in time on this planet doing something for them. I'm going to do something for the common everyday man and woman and, and, and adult that keeps them, gives them the option of staying warm having water, having food, having energy and having something to do with their shit and, and and doing something with their garbage. I mean, there's an interesting story that 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 happened to me in Brazil. I was doing a lecture at uh, some conference. They call these conferences all the time, uh, bring people together and have a bunch of rhetoric about sustainable autonomy and everything. Then everybody goes away and nothing happens. But anyway, yeah. I went to one of these conferences. I was asked to speak. I think I was the keynote speaker or something. And I talked about my whole line of shit, like I'm talking with you. And, and I had a slideshow and everything. And they had, this was on the upper, up. this was about an hour and a half north of Buenos Aires. Uh, it was at near the Amazon jungles and all that in some little Swiss developed village or something. But it wasn't that far from from the tribes that are in the Amazon rainforest, and two chiefs from the tribes had, had were there. And one of them asked if, after my talk, he asked if they could get some interpreters and sit in a circle, and he could talk to me. And I said, "Oh yeah." And they had interpreters. He he didn't speak English. He had they had interpreters to. To, to interpret the whole lecture to him, really. He was scared shitless. 
because their young people were coming to these villages that were in the north and going a little further and bringing back candy bars, Coca-Cola cans. And see, their little villages, they've got every stick lined up and stacked. They've got every stone lined up and stacked. It's so neat and so together. And they know what to do with the stones. They know what to do with the sticks. They know what to do with the leaves. They didn't know what to do with the beer cans and the bottle caps and the cigarette wrappers and the candy wrappers and the plastic this. And they didn't know what to do. And they were stacking up and they were worried. They were scared. And, and you know, he saw me doing something with it. And, and it, he, here's what he said. He said, I will give you wives, goats, and land if you will come live with us. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a beautiful observation that he saw that you had solutions to problems because he's describing watching his own people fall into the trap of modernism, which you've already seen and turned modernism, the problems of modernism into the solutions, which is using the junk and the waste to go back to a more sustainable process. And we've now got enough junk and waste to build for you and every crew you could put together to build homes for the rest of their life and many, many lifetimes as it is. But I, but I think, you know, he was watching what he probably saw as the complete breakdown of his culture and saw you as someone who had the medicine to bring a marriage. It's like you just talked about going half the river you had already come half the river. He came out to meet you and say, how do we do this? And I, I have a lot of empathy for a man like that. And, and I obviously have a lot of respect for you or I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. One of the things you said in The Garbage Warrior, which I, I found very interesting, so I wrote it down. You mentioned that after you'd built an energy efficient home and were living in it, and now had no heating or cooling bills and all your food needs were met that you were, you felt truly free and it showed you kind of running out in the, uh, on the land there. And I, I just thought, I want to ask Michael what his definition of freedom is, because I think a lot of people don't really know what it means to be free anymore. A lot of people think being free means, uh, you got a whole bunch of beer in the refrigerator and, uh, you can pay your bills or whatever it is, or you got a big flat screen television or, uh, whatever. What do you think freedom is and how, how important is it that you think that maybe we get clear on what freedom really is? I think people have lost sight of that. I do. I agree with you. I think they have. Um, I think it's something to find. It's like the truth. You know, yeah. what, what do you think? What, what is the truth? You know, is the truth what, works. what, uh, what Gandhi says? Is the truth what uh, Joe Biden says? Is the truth what Putin says? Is uh, What is the truth? Well, you don't. It's sustainable. <laughs> yeah, you you don't. Uh, nobody can tell you the truth. You you have to observe the truth and and get yourself into situations where you can observe it. And freedom is the same way. Nobody can tell you what freedom is. Uh, is is the American dream freedom? Hell no. You know. Yeah. Uh, is is uh, do Americans have freedom? Hell no. We're trapped. We're trapped between politics, big pharma, uh, cattle industry, we, uh, you know, laws, regulations. We are not free. Free is free is my T-shirt. Fuck you. I don't need you. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's it. You don't you don't need anything. You have found a way to get food. You have found a way to get water, but you have found a way to to stay warm. and. And you and you have found a way to keep finding those ways, and you have found a, a way to, you know, it's like you you've certainly found purpose, and and you you found. See, I I uh, I feel like there's something pulling me like this constantly. And I've I've tried to drift off of it after this or after that, and it, I always end up getting pulled back, but I. I'm pulled and it's like, well, here, here, here is a way, here's a way to describe what I'm trying to talk about. You take a piece of paper 
and you put iron shavings on it. Mm-hmm. And then you put say, I got to try to arrange these iron shavings and organize them. So you got people with tweezers organizing iron shavings. Well, some bright guy comes along and sticks a magnet under it, and boom, they're all organized. That's the truth. And that is, in a way, a freedom because we need to be free from our own thinking that we have the ability to organize iron shavings. We don't. We have to be. So the only way you can get freedom is by diving into it and not having any holes barred. In other words, to get away from ego, intellect, whatever you want to call it, and let who who is going to let the magnetic fields define things for them? I am, but but because no person has ever defined anything worth a shit to for me, but but a magnet all of a sudden defines defines everything. The sun defines everything. You know, gravity defines everything. These definitions are unarguable. And you kind of have to like, I don't know, you call it surrender or or whatever. You have to, I think we were given intellect so that we could throw it away. Yeah, yeah. I, I There's a lot of truth to that. You know, what you're describing is very in line with Taoism and, you know, the Zen principle of no mind, which is really using your unconscious and your intuitive, intuitive conscious to follow the Tao, which is really the flow of the forces of nature. And, um, you know, letting, just like you talked about the river, you know, the, if you get into river rapids that are big enough, using your oar is not going to help. You just have to lay down and let the river take you. It's, and I think we keep trying to force the river to do what we want to do, but, you know, eventually you, you realize you can't force the forces of nature. You either work with them or they uh, all will take you out. Um, and, and, and speaking, you know, and also, you, you know, one of the words we haven't used yet that we've talked about gravity, we've talked about truth, but love is really what organizes those magnetic filings. And I think, you know, you haven't used that word, but it seems to me like you have a genuine love of humanity and want to see people have the opportunity to really live. And I think that thing that's pulling you from your heart, you grabbed yourself right there is really love. And I think love is ultimately the organizing force but if the intellect gets involved, then love gets kind of twisted and dirty, as as we all know, and uh, many preachers have proven that to us. But um, one of the things that you said in your documentary is you spoke of how architects couldn't see and don't see past the rule book, and you know you talk about all the the fiery hoops you had to jump through to try to get your subdivision approved and you know, all the shit with your architect's license being taken away and, and all the work you did to try to get a plot of land to do experimental research for, you know, developing new housing ideas. I found that was fascinating. And thank God for that lady that was so helpful to you because she really was an important person. And there's maybe great spirit putting some help there for you. But, you know, I'd like it if you could share your thoughts about uh, the challenges of us being so caught up in this rule book that's not taking us anywhere how do we uh how do we as individuals or a collective uh get rid of the rule book but don't create so much chaos at the same time that we just end up in a worse situation well that you're talking about revolution uh revolution doesn't work there's no re- there's no revolting or re- or 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 fighting our uh, I, will, I like what G- Chief Joseph said. I will fight no more forever. Uh, yes, that's where I'm at. I've got I a sculpture no of him forever. right here, right on my wall. Of Great. my mother. My mother's a quite a famous sculptor, and she specializes in people that devoted their life to peace. And I have a beautiful bust of Chief Joseph sitting right here. And I used to be a medicine man and spirit guide in the, uh, under the Nez Perce Indians tribe. So I'm very familiar with Chief Joseph. I know his life story. Well, like that's I think. Uh, I will fight no more forever is the, I'm not going to go against the grain. I'm not going to, uh, you know, I tried to, I try. I fought the law and the law won. 
I joined the law with, and, and it was solid bullshit. Four years of <laughs> solid bullshit, and uh, and so I I did everything, and so now I don't I don't. There's no. Uh, it's kind of an aikido approach. I'll take the energy of a law and turn it on itself or something like that. Uh, but I mean, I basically. Uh, a way I look at it is, um, say, uh, somebody's coming at you with a knife. You know, they teach you all kinds of martial arts and how to turn it on them and everything. But, but what if they just struck you with the knife, and and you were you were a mirage, you were a gas, you weren't a solid thing, and the knife just went right through you. It didn't. You 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 weren't anything that a knife could damage. And I, it, you sort of project that on and on and on, and it becomes a, a, a way that I've been looking at it as um, you have to learn to die before you die. Yeah, yeah. In other words, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, Mike Reynolds is dead. He, he doesn't exist. His, his ego is dead. His, his uh, intellect is dead. Uh, the body is doing whatever. But like the, the, the death, Willing to allow yourself to be nothing, nothing. You can't, you can't hurt me because th there's nothing here to hurt. You know what I mean? That I mean, I'm saying that that's a direction to go in. I'm not saying I'm there. I'm not a gas, but I have comprehended the the concept of of being a gas to the point of I see everything from so many sides and distances that. My vision of you or of anything is seen from so many directions, and it's an orbit. It's but it's or so many orbits that it, it becomes a gas, and and I see that there's no reason to define you or myself, and so you know you just take it. You can't you can't even go into those places unless you can get into a place where you can relax and have sustainable autonomy to start with and then you can start thinking about escaping yourself you know yeah. what I mean? mm -hmm. how do you escape yourself when you're just trying to feed your kids you you can't you so we have to put ourselves in one you know how you, you there's a big mountain off in the distance but you can't even see it so you have to get up this hill so that you can see the hill before it then you get up on that hill and finally you can see the mountain that you're actually going to but you can't even see we cannot even see where we're going till we get up to certain levels. And one of those first levels is learning how to take care of ourselves on this planet without destroying the planet and each other. Yeah, it's it's interesting because, uh, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs shows you the structure of how each level of need depends on the ones below it. Uh, Claire Graves has a whole system of values tree a value structure. Um, there's a variety of systems out there like that. And um, I think it's interesting as well that the founders of all the world's great religions were wealthy people. Muhammad's wife was very wealthy. Buddha's father was a king. Uh, Jesus was given frankincense, myrrh, and gold by the wise men. And the uh, billionaire Peter Daniels spent, paid five of the world's top theologians to investigate what his potential net worth would have been. They concluded he was worth about uh, six billion U.S. dollars. So if he wanted a new donkey, it came straight off the showroom floor. If he wanted to feed 5,000, he could wave his checkbook. But I'm only just pointing out that when you start looking historically, then what you're saying is very true. You have to have the means to meet your core needs before you can really get past the the reptilian mind because the reptilian mind our brain stems oriented toward am i safe if i'm safe what can i eat and now that i'm safe and i got food it's time to procreate and those are the core survival needs and i think in order for us to go into the spiritual evolution of transcending ourself, we, we do need more of what you're really trying to inspire the world to do. And I think that's very, very important. The, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's uh, looking at the 
World Economic Forum, which I suspect you're aware of, their, their whole concept is you'll own nothing and be happy. And they claim they're one of their reasons for doing this is to protect the environment. But I've done a very comprehensive investigation into who owns these companies, and they own the very companies that are destroying the environment. So uh, I think that's just a load of bullshit. So I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on, on this whole World Economic Forum, a great reset, own nothing and be happy concept? Well, it's, it's back to freedom. Like, I, I'm. I call myself the richest person in the world because I want garbage and shit, and nobody else. Wants. <laughs> I love it. So, so those are the those are the things that fuel my life, and nobody wants them. So it's a it's a matter. Of, did I do this consciously or what? Did I did I alchemize garbage and shit just so I could be the most wealthy man in the world? Because I got people calling me up all the time wanting me to get their tires, get their bottles, you know. And I don't have people calling me up wanting to, me to take their shit, but I'll 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 gravitate towards shit because I know how to turn shit into food. And so uh, the thing is, it's 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 a I call it maneuverability. You you maneuver your mind and your your being to the point where what is around you is what you need. Yeah, you know what I mean, if you're around a bunch of shit you don't need, then you're trapped. But if if you have the ability to turn what's around you into what you want or need, then that's that's freedom. That's freedom. And like, uh, uh, you know, I I, so I don't need uh, anything. I look at everything. Okay, if I'm in a if I if I you know what, one of the things I'm getting I'm looking at is, okay, what can I do with nuclear waste? (laughs) You know, in other Uh, words, I'm looking at everything that's a problem. And figuring out a way to make it so I want it. In other words, you 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 have a picture of the beautiful concept of what you want: your home, the white picket fence, the dog, the cat, the family. That's what people want. They think they want, but it's it's really not that way. They strive to get that, and then they get it, and they're disappointed because it isn't it isn't it doesn't do it for them. What you what it's just to turn the sock inside out. What's around you develop a way to want it. And and that's that's freedom. Having the ability to maneuver in any kind of a world and make it so that it so that you're at peace with it. I'd say that is freedom. Hi guys, I hope you're enjoying the show. I had to take a little break to tell you that Symbiotic has just come out with an amazing new vitamin D product that will be ready for you by the time you get this little infomercial on it. So I've got Shervin here with me and he's going to tell us what is in his new product that's an upgrade from the previous product. So Shervin, everybody's talking about vitamin D obviously with COVID. So what should we know about this product and why should we use it? Well, we're supposed to be getting our vitamin D from the sun. Yes. That's our ultimate source, right? Yeah. UVA, UVB rays, rays hit, our, hit the cholesterol in our skin, converts to vitamin D in the body, a fat-soluble vitamin, and boom, which is great, which is why we go out in the sun every single day. But if you're looking for something a little bit extra, or perhaps you're somewhere that you're not getting enough sun. Which or is per- a lot of places. It's 80% of the world. Yeah. And depending on your genetics and a lot of things. We got to make the best formula ever, typical Symbiotica style. So we use D3 coming from lichen, which is Mm -hmm. a cross between fungi and algae. Mm -hmm. And we have 5,000 IUs in this formula, which is up from 3,000. We also have both forms of vitamin K2, which works synergistically with vitamin D3. Vitamin K2 is responsible for removing free-floating calcium out of your blood and arteries and your heart and brain tissue Mm -hmm. and actually where they belong into your bones. Super critical today. We need to get the the right forms of calcium into our bones. Vitamin K2 does that. And we have the MK4 and MK7 versions in there. We also have CoQ10 in there, Mm. which is a strong heart antioxidant. You throw that in there in liposomal form and all organic materials in there from the essential oils. We actually went with a tangerine flavor on this. We we found a really good tangerine oil. It's organic. It's the best ever. It's creamy. It's delicious. It comes to you in a Myron bottle, just like all of our stuff. Mm -hmm. This is really like immunity in a bottle and it's very, very delicious and versatile. And is it safe for kids? Absolutely. Any age? 
any age. Yeah, there's no counterindications with children whatsoever. Excellent. Well, that's a very important product today with all the viral shock going around and whatever else they're giving us. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, obviously a lot of people are getting sick because they're just not eating well and they don't have the right supplements. And so, in the busy world we live in, with a lot of people being indoors. I mean, I know people that are vitamin D deficient that live in Florida because they're indoors too much. So absolutely, I'm excited to be able to share this with you guys. Get your top-notch Symbiotica vitamin D at C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. For your Living 4D discount, use CHECK15 on checkout and get ready to be absolutely amazed with your vitamin D upgrade. We've talked a little bit about the issue of corporate control. I call the White House the uh, <laughs> corporate headquarters of America. It's not by the people, for the people anymore. Anybody that has two brain cells holding hands can see that. Um, what are your thoughts on how we can all collectively get past the corporate financial influences that uh, has taken over government and is really stopping us from uh, in many ways from just like you went through all this hassle with, the, you know, trying to get your, your uh, subdivision approved and they took your architect's license away. Uh, what, what do you think, or do you have any ideas of what people can do collectively to sort of start freeing ourselves from this tyrannical, keep doing what you're doing, keep burning fossil fuels, keep eating junk, keep taking drugs, keep watching shit television keep letting the medical system cut you apart, dot, dot, dot. Uh, you know, obviously you've given us a model, you, you, you're you doing it, but as you know, this has to be done on a much bigger scale. I'm curious if you've meditated on what we could collectively do to start moving as a people toward a more independent, sovereign uh, life where we're not living off the corporate hind tit all the time? Well, it's a, a, an easy way for me to look at it is the concept of a virus. I mean, I would say that I am uh, just like the coronavirus. I'm, I'm here doing something. And, and I'm basically going around the world sneezing on people. You know what I mean? <laughs> Good. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. And they're and I, you know, I get people that they, they get the virus. I mean, they they quit their jobs. They go, want to go in this direction. They, you know, they they want to start doing it. We have people, we've been to so many countries and everything that there are people in every country that have this virus and they're, they're sneezing on people themselves. It is happening. It is happening on the level of a virus. I don't, I think organizing it uh, would be, would be, problematic for sure but yes i mean um so you feel it's happening organically is what you're saying it's happening organically but i have to say not fast enough and that's that's a concern that i have is it i can't be comfortable sitting here knowing it's not happening fast enough and so i'm looking at ways to make it happen faster uh and yes if i if i i could right now i mean you know i have i have the land I could just go but, uh, and, and, and build a city right now, uh, but it would take money and it would take uh, more of a, uh, a, a dent into the regulatory system uh, than I have got. And so uh, what, I, what I have uh, looked at is going in the direction of, of, of a monastery. A monastery doesn't have regulations. I and see. So yeah. Do a monastery. As long as you meet a certain see, so what I'm saying is, I'm looking at ways to turn regulations and laws and dogma inside out and on itself, so that this can grow. That's what cancer does. That's what viruses do. I'm learning from cancer and viruses, and uh, to to move in that direction. You can't talk to a building inspector about that or anything like that. But um, so what I'm saying is just doing it. I'm doing it. Every day I'm doing it. And there's, you know, I'm, you, you said something about um, you don't have to go to a spa and, and whatever. Well, see, there's four things people do that or the way I see it. They, they do go to a spa 
a lot of people to keep in shape, lift weights and do all kinds of stuff. They go to a church or a synagogue or a yogi or something like that for spiritual. Then they go in another direction for employment to make money for livelihood. Then they have a fourth direction, uh, hobby, golf or whatever that makes them at peace and they like to do it and whatever. Well, what if you, then those things take energy, time, each one of those four directions takes energy, time and money for you to get the four things that say you need to be a, a, a healthy whole person. For me, and I stumbled onto this, my hobby is my religion, is my income, and is my, keeps me in shape. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I do the same thing. Everything that I do is one laser beam toward all the same thing. And I, you know, it's my hobby, so I want to do it all day long. It makes coherence. enough money, so I do it all day long. It gives me spiritual wholeness, uh, you know, and and so what I'm saying is that's, that's huge right there. Yes, it is. A lot of people could have something like that. Uh, yeah, I'm never bored. I'm never uh, uh, depressed. Uh, you know, I get stage four cancer, <laughs> and mm. and I'm and it's like an adventure. So uh, what I'm saying is that can happen on the foundation. That couldn't happen if I was living in an apartment trying to to pay the rent and pay utilities and all kinds of stuff like that. That happens when when you have already gotten security and sustainability and autonomy out of the way. That's why I'm saying the powers that be, and this is a laughing dream, but if 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 the corporate world and the political world, if the governments could provide people with, you know, you know, to the we go around suppressing people and 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 taking their oil and and taking their land and all of this stuff uh, and and then we want power and they don't uh, they don't they they succumb to our power but uh they 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 don't want to but they do you know the united king the 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 united kingdom used to go around the world doing that the us is doing it russia's trying to do it trying to take over the world and people hate it yeah but what if you were going around the world giving everyone that could walk and breathe that was an adult a little home that took care of them? It, 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 you would be you would be worshipped. You would literally be worshipped. The, the the these power mongers they want to be worshipped. They want power. The fact that you don't want it, you just want them to to have their own power, gives you more power than you could ever dream of. And that's that's the thing. Everything is inside out. Everything is backwards. And you don't beat people down and try to lead them. You empower them and you empower people to have their own sustenance. That's that's a that's a key statement right there. Empower people to have their own sustenance and they're going to know where it came from. And that's that's the that's the thing that would cause the virus to spread over the planet. Yeah, I love it. And, you know, one of the things that I really found interesting about your Garbage Warrior documentary was when I believe it was a tsunami that hit in India and you went there and you helped them with their water situation and taught them how to use the tires and and all sorts of stuff. But, you know, you, 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 you mentioned how amazing it was to work without all these restrictions. And they were, because they were down on their knees, they were open to novel ideas and that you were like a for me it looked like you were like a kid in a candy store you're like okay finally someone that'll listen to me without throwing the rule book at me so i'm i'm just curious you know how is it going to take a a disaster a tsunami to blast us to hell before we let listen to michael reynolds or 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 do you think we just have to let this as you call it a virus grow and hope we we can survive before it takes hold i'm playing both I'm playing both sides of the of the fence on that. I'm 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 trying to make the virus grow, but at the same time I'm aware of the fact that, you know, when it really does get bad, that that people will, you know, you right, you take the the a great example is the Titanic sinking. You got all the wealthy people up on the upper levels and the poor people down low, and they wouldn't even, you know, they wouldn't let the poor people come up to the ballroom or anything, you know, they're 
the, the poor, the wealthy people didn't want to encounter the poor people at all. But when the boat was going down in the ice cold Atlantic and you got a raft out there full of poor people and you're rich, you are going to get in that raft. You know what I mean? That's yeah. the thing. The fear of dying, the fear of not having, the fear of pain, suffering, that will break it all down. It all breaks down then. I'm, that's coming. But if I can cause the virus to go ahead and make the Titanic not run into an iceberg or make everybody not on a Titanic, make them all on little v- vessels all their own anyway. Uh, or let them, all different ways. Like, let them move between the floors without all the bullshit. Yeah. Like, like, so I'm playing both and I play, I play many hands. I'm around a poker table right now and I'm all of the people around the poker table. I'm playing every hand. Uh, the, the idea is for somebody to win. Yes. Or everybody to win. But I am everybody. So whoever wins, I'm happy. Yeah, See, good. It's like sitting in an earthship. If it's, if it's sunny, I'm happy because I'm getting electricity. If it's raining, I'm happy because I'm getting water. If I'm every person around the poker table, whoever's winning, I'm happy. Yeah. I just want beautiful. somebody to be winning. It's a beautiful philosophy. I'm, I'm really grateful that you've grown to your own realization of that because it's that synthesis within you that helps other people see that possibility for themselves, which leads right to my next question. And before we close it up, um, toward the end of the garbage war, you stated that the American dream is God. And that brought up two issues for me. All human beings are expressing both a personal and a collective myth. I'm wondering what you feel the myth is that the American dream was built on. And what do you feel is likely to emerge as our next li- uh, myth that we live by? Or, or what, what do you think? Will, what, what myth will it replace the American dream? So what, what do you think the American dream was built on mythologically and what do you think is going to replace it if you can be a bit of a prophet for us? Well, I think, I think the American dream was manufactured not by one person, but by the manufacturers, by the manifestors. They manufactured and slowly manufactured and slowly, the hell, they got the American dream and then technology made it so they could even present it more and more. And they brainwash people into thinking there was an American dream. There's no American dream. There never has been American dream. And people that have gotten to what they think is American dream, it's like the end of the rainbow. You get there and it's gone. You get, oh, it's over there. You keep going. You keep going. Nobody's ever had the American dream. Donald Trump sitting in his mansion. He doesn't have the American dream. Hell, America, half America wants to crucify him. Uh, it wasn't enough anyway. He got the American dream he got, and it wasn't enough. It's never enough. The American dream is a rainbow that can't be reached. And so the thing is, the new dream that I would propose that we entertain in our thoughts, sit back and look at the rainbow from here and appreciate it. And and if you sit there long enough, you might even see a double rainbow. Yes. Suck it in, absorb it. It's here. You don't have to go find the end of the rainbow and expect some kind of pot of gold there just to be sitting here and looking out across the mesa and seeing a rainbow or maybe a double rainbow. Whoa, there it is. That's the American dream. That's the dream. That's a that's the earth dream. Uh, you know, it, there's no tangible thing there. There is a state of being that that starts with getting out of the mundane level of survival, which is what we're all in right now, get out of the mundane level of survival, get that together so that we survive by encountering the planet. And then that's freedom and the sky's the limit. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you use that analogy of the rainbow because I live in a little town called Rainbow and our property is called Rainbow Hills. So I think I'm already in the dream and enjoying it and and I'm doing, we, my whole family is doing a very lot of what you talk about from composting to having our own crops to solar to water. So uh, it, it's been uh, fascinating 
journey. I, I really enjoyed watching your videos, your Garbage Warrior documentary. I think is important for everybody to see. I've already texted the URL to many of my friends and said, you got to see this. This is like, there's a lot of solutions for the problems that we're all facing right now. And not only are they solutions, but they're solutions that allow us to use a lot of the garbage on the planet productively. So in closing, Michael, I, I, I'm just going to let you know I'm very grateful for, for your commitment to everything that you've done and to yourself. And uh, if there's any comments or recommendations for resources or places you'd like to send people to learn more about you or the Earth ships or your whatever you want to share, uh, fire away. Well, I think um, we we put it out there in terms of internships, academy, nightly rentals, books, uh, stuff on YouTube constantly. Uh, you know, we're just we're just excreting. You know what what has worked and and what hasn't worked, and the response has been it gets more and more. Uh, uh, geometrically uh, magnified uh, as time goes on. And so we know, we, we, we kind of know we're on a track that, uh, a, a direction, I wouldn't call it a track. We kind of know we're in a, in a direction that is a valid way to conduct life on this planet. We don't have all the solutions. We don't have all the answers, but our direction is, is, uh, here, here's a, here, I guess this is the way I would say what's, what we're doing. Uh, and it's pretty basic, but, um, we're, if, if you imagine you're in a subway car and there's a cave in a breakdown and the subway car is trapped and, and the power's out and everything, and all of a sudden you're with 80 people in a cavern underground, and it's so pitch black you can't see your hand in front of your face. And you're with 80 people, and nobody knows what to do. And you don't know what to do. Nobody knows what to do. People are starting to panic, starting to cry. Things are starting to get weird. Well, I looked over. I was there, and I looked over around in the darkness. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face, and I looked over, and I saw a pinhole the teeniest pinhole of light. And I made my way over to it. And I started pulling rubble away from it and it got to be a little bigger of a pinhole. And I started pulling more rubble away from it and it got a little bigger. And, I, and it got a little bigger again. And then, then people started coming over and helping me pull the rubble away. I didn't ask them to. I didn't say this is the way, the truth, and the light. I just said, I just started doing it. And people came and started to help me pull the stuff away. And pretty soon, Half the people there helping me pull stuff away and it's getting bigger and bigger. And we're starting to visualize that maybe we can get it big enough that a human body can get out of it. That's, that's in, in every way, that's the thing that we're the direction we're headed to. Yeah. That's what we're experiencing. Yeah. Well, I, I really, I think that's important. I think it's a great way to end. And I think it's a beautiful metaphor that uh, <laughs> crosses the line of metaphor into hard reality. And, uh, you know, my dream is that we don't have to wait for the subway car to be crap trapped or crushed or anything terrible before we realize that the light is shining, like you said, right out of the sun and the water is falling out of the sky. And, it's really about just using the resources we have more intelligently and using our collective intelligence together instead of being oppositional and having the foresight to realize that if we are proactive now, we, we don't have to be caught in the sub car, uh, subway car suffocating and uh, you know going into the situation you so quaintly described as getting weird. Um, so I really appreciate what you're doing and, um, I'm grateful that you have devoted your life to it. I'm grateful you followed the compass of love that keeps pulling on your heart and organizing your iron filings for the benefit of all of us. So keep doing what you're doing, Michael. I'm, I'm, uh, 
grateful I can share you with as many people as possible. All right. Thank you. That was fun. We'll thank you. you. And thank you to my sponsors. Thank you to the listeners. And thank you to all of you for anything you buy from the sponsors that supports the podcast. You've got Michael's resources in the show notes. I hope this brought you all into a state of meditation and uh, maybe you're one of the ones that'll be like Michael and bring some concepts and some possibilities forward and break some rules and have some new ideas and uh, do something good that we can all support each other with. So lots of love to all of you. I look forward to sharing with you soon. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Michael Reynolds. You can find Mike online at earthshipglobal.com, on Instagram at Earthship, and on YouTube and Facebook at Earthship Biotecture. For anyone who would like to learn more about Earthships or learn how to build your own, Mike is offering Paul's listeners 10% off the tuition for his academy program. Just mention Living 4D with Paul Check when you register. To find out more about the Academy program and to register, visit earthshipglobal.com. Follow Paul on Instagram and TikTok at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. 